and thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, so let's get started right away. My topic is the evaluation of Arabia's trade routes with least cost pass analysis. My research question was, is it possible to understand the reasons that led people to walk a certain route? To look on the route they, look, they took and understand how they perceived landscape and made decisions. Is it possible to identify pathfinding strategies as a proxy for perception of space? With the domestication of the Dromeda at the end of the second millennium BC, a wide network of trade routes began to develop uh, and by the late first millennium BC, uh, we see well-established trade connections inside the Arabian Peninsula. They connect to different regions inside the Middle East, like Assyria, Mesopotamia and Egypt, and even to the Greek and Roman world. Uh, one important part of this trade was the export of valuable fragrances, like frankincense and myrrh, from their places of origin in Southern Arabia to consumers in Greece and Rome. Uh, this trade peaked between the 5th century BC and the 2nd century AD with an estimated export margin of 2,000 tons, tons per year. Uh, incense was an expensive but very common fragrance in Rome and Greece. It was burned inside temples, at funerals, at festivities, and even in public places to cover the stench of the sewers. The main artery of this trade was the land route along the western edge of the Arabian Peninsula that connected the regions of productions in Tofar and Hadramaut uh, in modern Yemen and Oman with the ports uh, in southeastern Mediterranean Sea. Uh, this is called the Incense Road. I see. Uh, yeah, here, Hadramaut region along the western edge until Gaza. There are a few contemporary sources reporting on the trade routes and the organization of the business in antiquity. Uh, based on these, it is possible to identify nodal points and reconstruct the topology of the trade route network. Here, the incense route is marked in red. Um, Yatripa refers to uh, Al Medina, the city of the Prophet. Hegra is uh, today known as Medein um, Saleh. Taima is still the same name. Um, Petra is known, I guess. Uh, Gaza still has the same name, so just for orientation. Uh, travel reports from the 19th century and modern archaeological research provide a base for more detailed reconstructions, down to the level of itineraries that name every single daily stop of a journey. In combination with different topographic maps like the US Army Map Service Series 1301 and gazetteers like the GeoNet Names Server by the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, it is possible to reconstruct the uh, routes in details. This is of course not the ultimate answer, but uh, the most likely approximation. Yep. As you can see, sometimes more than one route exists between two places, uh, like here's a case between Daima and Dumat. Uh, or a route splits up and rejoins later, like here's a section, tri uh, yeah, tripa. we have a split here, a split here, uh, a split here, so it's like, let's see, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, like the US Army map service map, uh, you can see it's a nice uh, material to work with, it's, uh, it's like uh, welds, it has tracks, uh, here's a red one, it's like tracks and caravan routes, uh, uh, the, the black one is the Hedra's way away. Um, yeah, like uh, uh, topographical features are named. Uh, if, uh, if we get a really good idea on the, on the landscape. My hypothesis was that this caravan routes would correspond closely to the least cost pass. This is based on two assumptions. First, the motivation. The trade of incense was, like every trade, a profit-orientated endeavor and one certain way to maximize profits is to minimize costs. To design cost-efficient routes was therefore an intrinsic motivation of caravan organizers, at least in theory. Second, uh, every year dozens or, or dozens to hundreds of caravans started and moved along the same track uh, since the incense route was active over hundred years, hundreds of years. Uh, this adds up to tens and hundreds of thousands of iterations optimizing the routes for cost efficiency. A third point adds to the applicability of least cost pass analysis, the limitations. 
natural barriers as well as the general orientation of the routes and the landscape uh, provide a framework of limitations that significantly narrow down the variety of uh, possibilities. So my plan was to compare the reconstructed routes with the least cost paths. If they were identical, I could conclude that cost efficiency seemed to be the only factor influencing the pathfinding. If they did not correlate, I could understand that other factors were influencing the pathfinding and then try to identify these. Uh, the method used in the study is a very simple one. We have a slope-based cost function and a land surface-based cost function. Both are correlated to an accumulated cost surface to which standard pathfinding algorithms are applied. The model was coded in R using the G-distance package, while the general work of data preparation and visualization was realized in QGIS. The slope-based cost function uh, contains, contains two redundancies. First, the use of three different resolution DEM, and second, the use of three different uh, walking cost algorithms. One note on the DEMs. ALOS DAM is a development by the Japanese space agency and available for free since 2006. The 30 meter version of the DAM is downsampled from the 5 meter version, which means it has a precision of 5 meter horizontal and 5 meter vertical. In comparison, the popular SRTM DAM has only 20 meter horizontal precision and 60 meter vertical precision. Uh, these redundancies were implemented to have a bit of comparability. This should make the model a bit more uh, reliable to have like, results I could compare in a way. Um, the point about the three uh, cost algorithms is that like, uh, it is still like, um, it's a field of research to uh, model the energy expenditure um, of humans or other animals uh, and to, to, very, like, to have uh, good results. This, uh, everything is still in discussion. The so land surface based cost function needs a little bit more explanation. The land service is based on the geological mapping undertaken by the USGS World Energy Assessment and the Vector Map Level Zero database, which represents the fifth edition of the digital chart of the world and is freely, freely available at a scale of one to one million. The model consists of four classes of land surface based on how much it slows down movement. The first class, grassland or steppe, is, uh, it is a basic class with no negative effects on movement and covers around 85% of the peninsula. The second class, lava field, covers around 5% of the peninsula. The sharp and uneven surface hurts the camel's soft feet. <coughs> the animals are quite stubborn and often physically resist to walk on surfaces like that. The third class, dune seas, consists of very loose sand, uh, which give in to every step and absorb a lot of energy spent on movement. The fourth class, rivers, are naturally very scarce in Arabia. Uh, in the east of the Asia mountains, on the border between Saudi Arabia and Yemen, are some wadis which are considered permanent, but this does not concern this uh, narrowed down uh, study, case study uh, region here in the northern hedges. A note on the reliability on the landscape model. Systematic analyses of climatic archives are very rare on, the, rare on the Arabian Peninsula, but a study of a paleo lake next to Taima uh, in northwest Saudi Arabia, I can show you again Taima here, um, and other uh, more general studies about the uh, climatic history of the region agree that the aridization process stabilized during the early 4th millennium BC on the level known today. Uh, today is a relative term since, uh, since the record, uh, since the second half of the 20th century, a misled settlement policy with extremely high agricultural subsidies led to a man-made desertification that changes the landscape drastically until today. But since most of my uh, sources were from the 19th and 20th century, this was not like, very much uh, an issue for me. <coughs> Uh, how to quantify these effects uh, of terrain on the energy expenditure of movement? Luckily, there are already uh, established coefficients uh, as seen in the upper table on the right. But they are optimized for human mov movement, which causes a problem, especially the fact that movement on stony surface is less of an obstacle than movement on sand uh, does not fit at all to the observations uh, on the camel's behavior. Coefficients which fit for horses cannot be applied here, because the horse's hard hoof have very different characteristics than the camel's soft uh, feet. 
Since I could not find any fitting approach, I decided to estimate coefficients uh, which are orientated on the ones for humans. Uh, this point is very much up for discussion and I'm very thankful for every input and uh, criticism. Now I want to present and compare two root segments which I already investigated closely. The first one is the Yatripa Hegera section, which is part of the main incense road. Um, please note that the maps are not orientated uh, to the north, but like just to be horizontal, to be nice in the picture. So um, here in Yatripa, uh, we start, okay, like red is a reconstructive route, uh, black is a Hijaz railway, and green is a uh, LCP. And uh, we see here is a, a split uh, on the reconstructed route. The LCP correlates to the uh, upper split, uh, correlates further with the reconstructed route. Here's another split where the LCP shows the uh, southern uh, split. Um, here we face a situation where the reconstructed route uh, splits very widely, and the LCP is like uh, in the middle of that. Um, we see that like, uh, both of them correlate to antique cities, uh, which are also mentioned by the antique outdoors who are describing the incense road. So uh, we can be sure that these are like, actually um, stops on the, on the way. So uh, yeah, here we can see, okay, the route uh, did uh, make a detour to meet these settlements. And here in the end section, uh, again, another split where the SCP correlates to one of them. As we can see in the corresponding uh, passage corridor, the mountains and lava fields form a corridor that leads directly to Mochula, like from here to here. Um, yeah. A second corridor leads from Osada to Hegra. Like here is this direction, kind of. So like we have two corridors like here and here, <coughs> which are um, kind of perceivable and um, the, uh, the ambiguity in the middle of the section can be interpreted as a different approaches to get from the first corridor into the second one. Like, uh, one way would be like to, to uh, go directly to make it its the last possible stop or like to go in the middle like the LCP. That's like, it's a way uh, I interpret these uh, passage corridors. I'm also um, interested in different opinions on that. Uh, the second root segment I want to present is the Hegra Timer section, which is not part of the classical incense route. Two alternative routes exist, and none of them correlate at all with the lead curve path. In fact, they are orientated on wells and hills. Like here, uh, the grey ones are the reconstructed routes. Um, okay, we can here see here from the southern route that at the beginning there's a small correlation, but then again, um, they move very differently. Uh, see here, uh, it goes to the east, actually east, um, along the, uh, here's, a, here's a hill uh, line, a ridge of hills, and it goes along the hills until uh, it meets this point where it uh, turns straight northwards uh, to the well and straight to Taima. Here we see, uh, like, the red one is the, is the main route, the main incense road, and it departs the main road uh, after the bottleneck of Mabrak uh, and turns to the east. Uh, Probably uh, Jebel Al Rabia was the orientation point and it went straight like one daily tour, let's say, uh, until a known campground uh, and then it goes straight eastwards on the next uh, day, let's say, and meets uh, uh, Mukataba, which is a point which is actually uh, correlated with Himyarit uh, petroglyphs, so can be uh, actually identified with the incense trade or suspect, and then to Taiwan. The view on the passage raster reveals that the landscape is quite homogeneous and forms no obstacles at all. This is contraintuitive to the fact that the reconstructed routes are far away from being cost efficient. So like the fact that there's like no, nothing uh, um, uh, being in your way, there should be no reason not to walk the most efficient way. This tendency repeats itself uh, in the other sections as well, and if it ultimately proves to be a consistent pattern, it leads to a hypothesis of a two-class road system. The first class, the desert highways, are characterized by strict cost-efficient pathfinding, where detours from the optimal path are only undertaken to reach important settlements. The 
the second class, the side roads, are characterized very differently. Here, access to water and visibility of landmarks that support navigation are the prime factors of the pathfinding strategy. I see this study uh, as a small step. Uh, it fits well into the new field of desert road archaeology, but it can be also a good start for hinterland archaeology of the Arabian Peninsula, uh, which is lacking until now, like, uh, I mean, yeah, until now, like, uh, most of the archaeology in the peninsula is, like, taking place on the oasis settlements and the connections between them, the uh, interaction zones between uh, Bedouins, between uh, uh, sedentary people are, like, very uh, poorly investigated, like, uh, yeah. And uh, there's, like, one thing I would really like to do is a combination with the Oceana petroglyph database uh, just for the northern Hitches region, where I investigated there are like 70,000 entries which are all geolocated. Uh, I don't know yet about like the exact position, but uh, I think it's okay. And uh, yeah, that would be like already um, like, like uh, there are so many different languages. Uh, there are like petroglyphs from uh, Southern Arabian uh, languages uh, turning up in Northern Arabia. Like there must be a strong correlation. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like the. Uh, maybe you have uh, different ideas how to how can elaborate uh, this kind of study. And uh, yeah, I uploaded my code on GitLab. Um, the data itself I uploaded on Qubis uh, Cloud. Uh, yeah, so if you want to take a look, uh, it's all online. Thank you very much. <laughs>